15 minutes in that case that went uh, I prefer some presentation um, notes as well but I'm not 15 minutes I don't think I would finish it with 15 minutes hello we are live sir we are live great should we begin or should we yeah all right great Hello, salam, namaste, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us today for our fifth session of the webinar series on semicolonialism and international law, which is, as you know, organized by the Jindal Global Law School and Addis Ababa University Seychell Clinic. The only thing that uh, COVID-19 has given us, has enabled us, is for us to be able to have a truly global conference here, I, for example, now I see names Prabhakar from India. I'm in Geneva. Haile Gabriel is in Australia. Mahari in Addis Ababa. And everyone is from a different time zone from different parts of the world. And if you have ever gotten close to time travel, well, this is it. And today I am very happy to be moderating for Dr. Haile Gabriel Fayisa. I don't think he needs an introduction in this particular session, but I will do it just anyways, because there are going to be a lot of people that are also going to watch this after this particular session that are going to watch the stream on YouTube. Dr. Haile Gabriel Fayisa has been teaching law for the past 15 years in the top universities in Ethiopia. And he had also worked tirelessly to develop legal knowledge in Ethiopia by publishing teaching materials, books, book chapters, peer reviewed journal articles and op-eds. He is currently working at the Melbourne Law School as an associate, as a research associate within the Institute of International Law and Humanities at the University of Melbourne. His research mainly focuses on semi-colonial colonial encounters and international law in Sub-Saharan Africa. So he is basically the expert in this field. And his peer-reviewed journal articles that are entitled Non-European Imperialism and Europe Europeanization of Law, The Complexities of Legal Codification in Imperial Ethiopia, as well as European Extraterritoriality in Semi-Colonial Ethiopia, have shown, uh, have shown light and have uh, shown us on the European influence on juristic developments in former, formerly uncolonized Ethiopia. So we're also going to learn why an uncolonized state came to be known as a semi-colonial state in this particular webinar. Haile Gabriel is also the, one of the emerging scholar, legal scholars from the Global South that have shown interest in the theme of semi-colonialism. And he's probably the only one in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we're hoping that this webinar is also going to motivate other people to join him and to join us in this sessions as well. The one thing I really admire about Haile Gabriel is that he's the fact is the fact that he is a very strong proponent of the need to learn from the global south by looking at the actors and the sources from the global south. And this also helps to enhance the knowledge of the multifaceted relationships between colonial international law on the one hand and semi-colonized states such as Ethiopia on the other. I will now very happily leave the floor to Haile Gabriel. You now have the stage. Thank you, Leah, for the kind, the kind introduction. Thank you, AAU IHN Clinic and Center for International Legal Studies, Jindal Global Law School, for the opportunity to make this talk. I am deeply honored. Before proceeding uh, with my talk, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm seated right now. I'd also like to express my solidarity with the peoples of Ethiopia, particularly the peoples of Tigray who have been at the receiving end of unimaginable state violence since the outbreak of civil war six months ago. The topic of my talk today is semi-colonialism in Ethiopia. The formulation or concept semi-colonial has, has its origin in Hellenist and Maoist traditions of describing and analyzing imperialist capitalism in the few juridically 
independent Asian countries of late 19th and late 19th and early 20th centuries, notably China. Refined and stripped of some of its original meanings, the concept continues to prove its significance in recent historical and legal scholarship. Often the formulation is used to distinguish development as pertaining to colonial encounters between Europeans and non-Europeans in formerly colonized states such as India with those in non-colonized states such as Thailand. The historical relations between the modern West and non-Western states of the, light, the late 19th and early 20th centuries have also been conceptualized through related concepts such as semi-periphery, informal imperialism, crypto-colonialism, and as such, uh, crypto-colonialism and more. A students of European imperialism, informally independent non-Western states, myself included, do not find it difficult to use some of these concepts alternatively or expansively. Despite warnings against some use of the term, some of the semi tropes in the analysis of dominance, violence, and resistance in places like Ethiopia. Ethiopia, also known as Abyssinia during the first half of the 20th, the 20th century, escaped direct colonialism by, the, by European powers during what in African historiography is known as the scramble for Africa. Menelik II and his successful context, contest with Europeans, with Italians at the Battle of Adwa, meant Imperial Ethiopia, Imperial Ethiopia's experience of European imperialism during the first half of the 20th century took a form different from the one that existed in colonial Africa. Hence, the use of semi-colonialism to describe the form of European imperialism in Ethiopia. The semi in semi-colonialism signifies the reality of formal sovereignty remaining intact. But that formal sovereignty was conditional on certain standards of civilization. And that form of sovereignty did not preclude process of informal imperialism. The hierarchical relationship between European and nominally independent and European countries like Ethiopia was often consummated through unequal treaties. In this talk today, which is largely based on a recently completed draft book chapter, I take you through Ethiopia's semi-colonial journey with the help of two unequal treaties that instituted extraterritoriality in Ethiopia during two different historical periods. These are the Franco-Ethiopian Treaty of Amity and Commerce of 1908 and the 1942 Anglo-Ethiopian Agreement of the, the 1942 Anglo-Ethiopian Agreement. Western attempts to commit Ethiopia to unequal treaties date back to the middle of the 19th century. For instance, the, the 1849 Treaty of Friendship and Commerce between Great Britain and Abyssinia considered the extension of British jurisdiction in Abyssinia regarding matters involving British subjects. But this treaty was never applied, and the treaty also, I mean, this treaty was never applied. It was also never a catalyst for legal change in the same way as other comparable unequal treaties were elsewhere in the semi colony. What students of European imperialism in Ethiopia regard as the first and most consequential treaty in Ethiopia's semi-colonial history was the 1908 Franco-Ethiopian Treaty of Amity and Commerce. This treaty is also known as the Klubowski Treaty after the French uh, uh, diplomat who signed the treaty on behalf of uh, France. The Klobowski Treaty was agreed with the bill to consolidate one of the most successful concessions granted to Europeans by the Ethiopian Empire. 
more specifically, the treaty aimed to facilitate the completion of the construction of the Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway through the re resolution of you know, some of the outstanding um, issues between Ethiopia and France. Uh, one of the outstanding issues was the issue of extraterritorial jurisdiction. Before being made redundant by Italian colonization in 1936, European and American extraterritorial rights in Ethiopia were primarily based on this treaty. The treaty eventually led to the establishment of the first mixed court in Ethiopian legal history. Unlike numerous treaties of amity and commerce between European and non-European states of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, this treaty provided freedom of travel, res residence, and property for subject, sub subject parties of the treaty, in our case, France and Ethiopia. The treaty fixed the amount of custom duties to be charged on French goods imported into Ethiopia at 10%. Also, an an MFN clause extended French subjects all the rights, advantages, and privileges Ethiopia might grant or may grant to subjects of other countries. Uh, but this treaty is best known for its non reciprocal Article 7 a provision regarding the administration of justice in Ethiopia. The said article envisioned the establishment of French, French extraterritorial jurisdiction in Ethiopia. Accordingly, disputes involving French subjects solely rep were replaced under French consular jurisdiction. Similarly, carceral power regarding French subjects in Ethiopia belonged to the French consul. The treaty obliged the Ethiopian Empire to hand over, <coughs> excuse me, to hand over to French consuls any arrested or con convicted French subjects in its custody. Should cases involving involve French and Ethiopian subjects, they should be tried by Ethiopian just working in consultation with French consul or his agent. The extraterritorial clause. The extraterritoriality clause also guarantees the application of French laws in cases where French subjects appeared as defendants. <clears throat> Finally, the court of the Ethiopian Imperial, which in Eric uh, is known as the Zufan Chilot, was designated as the final appellate body for cases involving French and Ethiopian subjects. As per the treaty, this regime was to be in place until such time that the Ethiopian legal system is Europeanized. In suspending Ethiopian sovereignty until progress is achieved by Ethiopia in Europeanizing its legal system, the treaty expressed one of Gong's five standards of civilization based on which the degree of civilization of non-European states was measured. Apropos, European states. For Europeans, the administration of justice based on institutions and laws alien to civilized Europe, <laughs> civilized in quotation, was an important indicator of the degree of civilization of any European state seeking European recognition and membership to the expanding international system, system of states. <coughs> the standard of civilization regarding domestic legal system was also an excuse for the imposition of extraterritoriality in some economic United States for an indefinite period of time. And as the experience of Ethiopia and other some American United States demonstrates, the approximation of one's own legal system to those existing in capitalist Europe was crucial for the abolition of extraterritoriality in formerly independent non-European countries. As such, the conditionality of Ethiopia's release from this kind of regime on its successful Europeanization of its legal system wasn't unique to Ethiopia. What is different is semi-colonials take off and end in, in, in imperial Ethiopia. 
the emergence of extraterritorial reality in other parts of the semi-colonial world preceded that of imperial Ethiopia by half a century or more. Furthermore, European, imperial, European legal imperialism in such semi-colonial polities as Japan already had profound effect in 19th century. As a result, Japan, a semi-colonial power whose su successful escape from European imperialism in late 19th century was an inspirational for early 20th century Ethiopian modernists. And Japan negotiated out of European extraterritoriality almost a decade before Ethiopia. Similarly, Turkey, Iran, Thailand were all approaching the end of extraterritoriality when Imperial Ethiopia was taking meaningful steps to translate the, the treaty obligations of uh, the, her treaty obligations vis-a-vis -vis France in uh, at the beginning of uh, the 20th century. So, uh, as I've been trying to say earlier, um, the, 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 the treaty regime uh, put in place by Kloboski Treaty wasn't uh, unique to, to Ethiopia, but what is unique is uh, its takeoff. And uh, as I will try to elaborate uh, later, uh, it's also different in its you know, end as well. Uh, because uh, the semi-colonial practices or techniques in Ethiopia continued after the Second World War as well. So uh, it was a bit later than you know, uh, the end of semi-colonial practices or techniques in other parts of the world. So uh, uh, while we are still on you know, uh, the Klobowski Treaty, we may ask uh, some few questions about why uh, semi-colonial techniques or why, you know, extraterritorial in particular uh, took off later than it, it, it did in other parts of the semi-colonial world or why it, it didn't, uh, uh, it, it wasn't abolished, you know, uh, towards the beginning of the 20th century or before, the, before um, the end of the second order. For this, as some of the tentative explanations include the demise of informal imperialism in Africa. Uh, the demise of informal empire in Africa following the Berlin Conference uh, is one of the factors that, you know, uh, the, one of the factors for the, the late takeoff of imperial, uh, for, for the late takeoff of extraterritoriality in Ethiopia. In the last two decades of the 19th century, European imperialists were more interested in directly colonizing African polities, including Abyssinia, than targeting them through unequal treaty regimes as before. Italy's late 19th century attempt to colonize Ethiopia was a case in point. Imperial Ethiopia's victory over Italy in 1896 was a significant historical factor uh, in the emergence of Ethiopia as a semi-colonial state that Europeans started to target for employment imperialism via unequal treaties in the form of uh, Klobowski Treaty. Slowly, the extraterritorial clause of the Klobowski Treaty was translated into practice. In particular, Imperial Ethiopia took steps to establish what was known as the Special Court, where an Ethiopian judge sat with the relevant European consuls to hear cases involving foreigners. Considered as the first mix mixed court in Ethiopian legal history, the Special Court functioned for a little over a decade between its establishment in 1922 and uh, the advent of Italian colonialism in 1936. Apart from the capital Addis Ababa, the special court or its branches sat in select provincial towns where a number of foreigners are uh, protect, protected by uh, unequal treaties to be signed with Europeans was seizable. It, it entertained cases involving Europeans and foreigners. 
even when the latter were not protected by either the Klobowski Treaty or other similar treaties, uh, which uh, MFN clause extended, you know, extraterritorial uh, privilege of uh, uh, the extraterritorial privilege Ethiopia accorded to French citizens uh, as per, you know, the Klobowski Treaty. Interestingly, subjects of Imperial Ethiopia that were not normally covered by the extraterritorial clauses of the Klobowski Treaty were sometimes treated as foreigners before the special court. Uh, for instance, <coughs> uh, for instance, uh, uh, Pastor, um, I mean, uh, some some peoples, uh, for instance, the Somalis, who, who were you know incorporated into the Ethiopian Empire, uh, successfully, you know, uh, got extraterritorial protection um, before the special court, uh, even though they were supposed to be, you know, uh, Ethiopians and not, you know. Uh, eligible to uh, protection and not eligible uh, for protection uh, under the Klobowski Treaty. So there are, you know, some complexities in the actual practices of, you know, uh, uh, some colonialism in Ethiopia. Uh, the decision-making process of the special court didn't follow a code of procedural law comparable with those adopted by mixed courts elsewhere. As a result, Europeans repeatedly called for reform for procedural law of the special court that was in part based on the Abyssinian custom. Europeans also showed concern over the appellate power of the Ethiopian imperial, which reassured the legislative and judicial sovereignty of Ethiopia over European subjects for much of, you know, uh, the, the early, for much of, you know, the, uh, the first half of the 20th century when, you know, this treaty regime was in place. Hence, there was, you know, a continued contest between Europeans and Ethiopia over, you know, the extraterritorial jurisdiction of, you know, European powers in Ethiopia and other um, imperial practices are there. In part because of their confidence in Abyssinian custom and law suitability uh, for the purpose of the special court, Ethiopians were slow in responding to European demands for change in the mixed court system. But Ethiopia, even though they were slow, still they wanted to get out of, you know, the Globalski Treaty and there were, you know, some negotiations between Europeans and Ethiopia in that record, but such attempts on, on the part of Ethiopia wasn't, you know, successful uh, because uh, Europeans rather wanted, you know, to impose on Ethiopia a more rigorous extraterritorial regime instead of, you know, abolishing uh, existing uh, imperial practices in Ethiopia. Incidentally, it's uh, worth noting that the focus of European imperialism in Ethiopia was not limited to extraterritoriality or the Europeanization of the administration of justice in the empire. As highlighted in discussions regarding the entry of Ethiopia into the extending European international society, Ethiopia's status as a civilized and European state was also assessed, <coughs> excuse me, on Geris Gong's fifth criteria, namely the elimination of uncivilized practices such as slavery. In particular, Ethiopia's admission to the League of Nations was conditional upon the abolition of slavery. And because of its entanglement with the question of Ethiopia's membership to the League of Nations, Imperial Ethiopia was more responsive to the standard of civilization regarding slavery than uh, demands for 
change in political organization or domestic legal regime as a whole. Nonetheless, the suppression of slavery and the slave trades as one of the official was one of the official excuses uh, for Italy to incorporate Ethiopia into Italian empire in the Horn of Africa. Uh, this happened in 1936, and uh, as a result of that, the extraterritoriality regime of the Klobowski Treaty came to an end with it. Uh, the form of semi-colonialism we saw uh, in the first third of the 20th century came to an end. Uh, so you could say uh, with Italian colonialism, uh, Ethiopia vanished from the map of uh, semi-colonial states uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, toward this uh, uh, in the in the, the towards the middle of uh, the 1930s. In 1935, Italy invaded Hylas Lassis, Ethiopia. Ethiopia's defeat to Italy in 1936 heralded a period of Italian colonialism. Despite its short duration, Italian colonialism in Ethiopia had some significant effects on Ethiopian society. Apart from undermining aspects of you know, uh, non-European imperialism, that is Abyssinian imperialism, it resulted in a significant increase in the number of Europeans, particularly Italians in capitalist inter enterprises. When Ethiopia was liberated from Italian rule with the help of the British in 1941, the issue of protecting these Europeans and their businesses in Ethiopia preoccupied the British, who were the dominant European power in Ethiopia then. Hence, uh, the 1942 Anglo Ethiopian Agreement. Haile Selassie's Ethiopia's uh, relationship with Britain in the 40s and the 50s was governed by the Anglo, the Anglo Ethiopian Agreement of 1942. This agreement contained detailed provisions pertaining to extraterritorial privileges of foreigners in Ethiopia. However, it was not a typical unequal treaty that focused exclusively on amity and commerce, but it meant to govern the relationship between a European power and a former colony of the European power helped free uh, from an enemy in the Second World War. A large segment of the agreement dealt with wartime matters, including the use of Ethiopian airspace, the competence and power of British military in Ethiopia, and the jurisdiction of British military tribunals, and the protection of prisoners of war. But it also included, as I said earlier, uh, a provision regarding the extraterritorial jurisdiction of Europeans in Ethiopia, or particularly the extraterritorial jurisdiction of Britain in Ethiopia. As per Article 5 of the agreement, jurisdiction over foreigners shall be exercised by the Ethiopian courts. But these Ethiopian courts were constituted in accordance with a draft law annexed to the agreement and were promulgated forthwith by the Haile Selassie, by Haile Selassie's government. The agreement entitled foreigners in Ethiopia to have their case tried before the High Court and on appeal, the Supreme Imperial Court. And in these quarters, we do have, we did have, you know, mixed benches composed of at least one British judge. And furthermore, the agreement instituted, instituted a committee composed of jurists from the British Empire that reviewed draft laws Ethiopia would promulgate. Ethiopia cannot enact laws without a certificate from its from this committee that screen proposed laws based on uh, repugnancy test. The agreement also excluded the unqualified application of Ethiopian laws to cases involving foreigners. This agreement was revived in 1942, and British, the British uh, lost some of the control they used to have uh, over Ethiopia and its policy, uh, this policy uh, I mean, uh, its sovereignty on some policy matters. But again, uh, aspects of you know uh, 
uh, European powers over Ethiopia, European informal powers over Ethiopia, continued despite you know the revision of this agreement in 1942 and the membership of Ethiopia in the United Nations after 1945. Uh, Uh, perhaps because of intensity and of course temporality, the extraterritoriality regime under the Anglo-Ethiopian agreement was more successful in persuading legal system overall than its early 20th century predecessor under the uh, predecessor, uh, the Klubowski Treaty. But it should be asked, why was Imperial Ethiopia that felt humiliated and unsuccessfully tried to have the terms of the Klopowski Treaty negotiated, persuaded to commit to, uh, was persuaded to commit to the more onerous Anglo-Ethiopian agreement? Also, why was not Imperial Ethiopia quick to extinguish elements of British extraterritoriality following the 1944 amendment? Of course, Accusations to stronger extraterritoriality appears to be a function of British power over Ethiopia in the 1940s. British power in post Italian Ethiopia was bolstered by the former's involvement in the liberation of the, the latter from Italy in 1941. Also, Ethiopia's desire to avoid hostile reaction from the British in other political arenas must have contributed to it. But but this doesn't seem to this, this doesn't only this doesn't seem to be the only explanation. The puzzling tolerance of British extraterritoriality beyond the 1940s appears to be mainly related to the desire to rip the benefit of British assistance in in its rather late nation building endeavor. Unlike some of its semi-colonial peers, especially Turkey. Imperial Ethiopia encountered semi-colonialism when it was re-emerging as an imperial power. It started its semi-colonial journey in the early decades of the 20th century at the back of both successful completion, competition for empire with Europeans and victory over Italy in 1896. And seen from the point of view of the Abyssinian elites, Imperial Ethiopia's escape from formal European colonialism meant planning and improving its non-European imperialism that was imposed on over two thirds of the empire's inhabitants for the first time. Yet the task of constructing a nation out of a newly built empire was a difficult one. Hence, British imperialism was in some ways a blessing in disguise to resource and technology limited Addis Ababa that was trying to consolidate a tenuous hold on multiple peripheries, the tolerance of the prolonged British extraterritoriality and the ensuing celebration of British decade and the resultant legal reform efforts as modernization, but not as manifestation of imperialism also relates to the instrumentality of British imperialism for imperial Ethiopia's non-European imperialism. In conclusion, Ethiopia is a less studied but interesting case of semi-colonialism. Although it may appear unique in comparison with a largely direct colonial encounter between the West and Sub-Saharan Africa during the same period or during the colonization of Africa, it is another case of colonial modernity that is state transformation in pursuit of independence from informal colonization. It is another case of hybrid resistance to European imperialism. It is another case of strategic appropriation and redeployment of colonial modernity in the service of third old imperialism or competitive colonialism as some would like to call it. Or it is another interesting case of uh, the persistence of informal empire, informal imperial practices after the Second World War. And this case should be studied uh, and studied more uh, closely for it can challenge nationalist historical narrative regarding legal modernization in Ethiopia 
And it can also contribute to post-colonial analysis of international legal history that is often done through cases of formerly colonized countries like India. Thank you. Thank you very much, Haile Gabriel. Uh, this is truly an eye opener, especially for, especially in, as an Ethiopian. Um, we are all very proud to say that we have not been colonized formally. And even when we talk about the, okay, when we talk about what happened after the Second Ethiopian Italy War, it's always spoken in terms of occupation, not even colonization in the, in the in the strict sense because the. Italian occupation was only was only Italy only had a stronghold in the cities and not in the rural areas. However, it's very important to see how much the European influence was in the in the legal history, in the practice, as well as the sovereignty of the country. And what I really find peculiar about semi-colonialism is that. It, the different shape that it takes from colonization, but indeed at the end of the day, it goes towards the same result, which is the subjugation and imposition over other non-European states. And it has really undermined the sovereignty of Ethiopia and other non-European states, states that we have been talking about so far. And particularly with regards to Ethiopia and the admission to the League of Nations, um, and the treatment of Ethiopia during the Italy, the Second Ethio-Italy War, and how the other states, other member states of the League of Nations, were reluctant to strongly impose the economic sanctions that were promised or the condemnation over Italy, was a very difficult time. And thank you very much for highlighting on these issues. I will now leave the floor to comments, to questions, for Dr. Haile Gabriel Faisa. Now the floor is open. Who wants to go? You may unmute yourself and ask questions, comments. Shall I? <clears throat> Yes, you may go. Am I recognized? Okay, uh, thank you, Haile Gabriel, for this uh, thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I would like to appreciate that. Uh, maybe two things. One, the issue that uh, Leah earlier raised in connection with the five years uh, so-called yes. occupation. Uh, are you arguing that it is a full-fledged uh, colonization uh, or what? what? What is that five years uh, uh, status of Ethiopia? Because some writers say that, uh, well, it was only brief, only five years. And the other is uh, the Italians were uh, only limited to the urban areas. Uh, the rural areas were uh, areas of resistance. Therefore, with these two things, it was assumed that uh, this was technically occupation rather than colonization. Mm -hmm. So what is your reflection on this issue? One. The other thing is, what about currently? Are we still, in your opinion, are we still semi-colonized or we have been liberated some time mm -hmm. uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for um, uh, the excellent questions. Um, on the first one, uh, yeah, um, I know I'm, uh, I'm aware of you know this uh, description of the Italian uh, period as occupation uh, rather than colonization, uh, but uh, I differ uh, from 
uh, this uh, understanding, nationalist understanding of uh, Ethiopian history, because uh, one, uh, Ethiopia during the first half of the 20th century, even when it was, you know, a member of the League of Nations, it wasn't an equal member of the League of Nations. Uh, as Rose Parfit would, uh, would argue, it was an unequal member of the League of Nations. It's, it was, you know, uh, a member, but a member which membership was conditional on upon, you know, certain, uh, the fulfillment of certain uh, conditions. So uh, there is that distinction between, you know, uh, Ethiopia, Ethiopian membership and the membership of other European countries, which were, you know, during the Second World War, were occupied by, for instance, Germany. So occupation in that sense might, you know, be uh, an appropriate description. But with with Ethiopia, it 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 uh, it cannot, you know, uh, be uh, an appropriate uh, concept to use because one the colonial. Uh, intentions of Italy was very clear and what was done during you know that brief period was uh, uh, clear that it was done with the intent of you know colonization not in you know, occupation uh, and the historical records are clear that Italy's ambition was you know to to to, to uh, Transform Ethiopia into uh, a settler colony of, you know, uh, an Ethiopian empire that, you know, uh, arrived at the scene of, you know, the scramble for the Horn of Africa late, later than, you know, the others, later than the the British or the French. So, with all that history, with all, you know, those empirical uh factors as well as you know the conception that there is a distinction between an equal member of uh an equal member of you know the international system of states uh i would differ uh from that uh understanding of the italian period as occupation so for me, yes, that was colonization, it, and it is a direct one. It is a direct one, and uh, it is uh, very consequential one. Uh, on the second one, uh, uh, if there is, you know something which we can learn from the history of semi-colonialism in Ethiopia, particularly the continuity of semi-colonial practices after, you know, uh, the official freedom of Ethiopia from the 1942 Anglo-Ethiopian agreement, is that there are, there are, you know, still continuities in informal ways, in subtle ways of, you know, colonialism in Ethiopia. Ethiopia in this regard, again, is not an exception. Uh, even though the, for some historical reasons, uh, the, uh, the extent of direct colonialism is not, uh, is not that significant as it is in other parts of uh, colonial Africa, in other parts of Africa. Uh, 
in terms of, again, effects, uh, the, the different techniques, there are, you know, different multiple ways of, you know, dominating and committing, uh, bringing, you know, viol and violating, you know, different uh, African politics and, uh, that uh, those techniques are still in play and uh, one of the things we can learn from you know uh, uh, engagement with uh, uh, current scholarship on some colonialism or informal imperialism is that uh, countries like Ethiopia are not you know outside of you know these informal practices of imperialism by dominant uh, powers, uh, capitalist powers. I would also like to add to this before I give the floor to someone else that uh, there were also massive differences in the treatment of Ethiopia and the treatment of Italy in that particular war, although Ethiopia was considered to be a member of the League of Nations on one level or another. There was also a treatment from international organizations that help people, that support people in, in times of armed conflict and the treatment of Ethiopia as less than and the Ethiopian sovereign knowing less than his European counterpart. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's also a reflection of the issue of semi-colonialism. Mm -hmm. Who wants to take the next question? Hi, Leah. I would like to take the next question. Okay, Salim, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Haider Gabriel. It was such a wonderful presentation. Uh, it's really uh, helpful, and I've learned a lot of things. Uh, my question is um, there are different types of semi-colonialism in different parts of the world, like in China and Taiwan and Afghanistan. So uh, what type does the Ethiopian semi-colonialism take? Uh, so in your view, uh, was it a competition between the superpowers? Uh, was it because of the strength of the indigenous communities? Um, what, were, what is the exact cause? Um, do, what do you think is the exact cause of semi-colonialism in Ethiopia? Um, well, uh, we can, uh, we, we, we can, um, talk about a lot of differences as well as, you know, similarities between, uh, Ethiopia and other semi-colonial polities. Uh, uh, what, uh, interested me most, uh, during, you know, my engagement with Ethiopian semi-colonial history was that uh, during the first third of the 20th century, it, it was kind of weak uh, semi-colonial, uh, semi-colonialism. Uh, and that uh, I think can be explained in terms of uh, a number of factors. One, uh, Europeans uh, at that time, uh, toward the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the, the 20th century, uh, weren't that much interested in uh, uh, informally colonizing Africans. The, 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 the norm uh, when Ethiopia emerged as a semi colonial power is that Africans uh, should be colonized directly and the, the, the competitions and even Ethiopia's relationship with Italy and even other European powers during that period uh, shows uh, uh, there is a, you know, uh, a desire to colonize Ethiopia or other politics in the world directly. Uh, so uh, part of the reason uh, is that Ethiopia's uh, position at the time uh, has uh, also, you know, some strength because of, you know, its appropriation of uh, uh, firearms, uh, 
it was in a better position to defend itself against, for instance, Italians. Um, that factor um, is important uh, in two ways. One, it can compete with it, with Europeans in uh, in the in in in, uh, in building empires, uh, as it did, of course. Uh, and two, it can also uh, contribute to uh, the a successful defense of you know its own. Uh, uh, sovereignty and in, in, in quotation again, sovereignty, because uh, the sovereignty we're talking about here uh, is not, you know, unqualified sovereignty because uh, immediately after uh, uh, repealing, uh, uh, defeating Italy, uh, we uh, commit ourselves to another unequal non-reciprocal -recipro treaty. Uh, which again is you know a function of uh, uh, our power, relative power with the you know European power. So uh, uh, these are, uh, in my view, the two important factors. Uh, the indigenous factor. Uh, there is you know uh, a room for. Uh, some agency as well because of you know the 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 the, the, the firearms uh, appropriated as well as you know uh, a long tradition of you know uh, building empires uh, and yeah so a bit of pause I would say yeah thank you uh, so uh, I was also thinking like um, can we uh, think of the effects of the semi-colonialism in Ethiopia? Like uh, how does the effect stand in current day Ethiopia? Like if we weren't semi-colonized, if we weren't under a uh, European um, mm. uh, imperialism, what, how would things be different now? Uh, how does the effects uh, export themselves in our current reality? What do you think? Well, uh... So, um, um, in, compar in, in contrast to, you know, the situation in, uh, uh, in the rest of Africa, here I'm not, you know, uh, trying to invoke, you know, Ethiopia's exceptionalism, but again, uh, I'm just trying to stress, you know, the importance of uh, acknowledging some basic differences between the colonial situation in Ethiopia and in the rest of uh, Africa. Uh, so uh, despite, you know, uh, this difference in the form of colonialism in Ethiopia and the rest of Africa, there are similarities in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in dominance, violence and resistance. So the resistance was the resistance to European imperialism within other parts of Africa as well as in Ethiopia, uh, violence or violation of, you know, uh, indigenous peoples were there in other parts of Africa and as well as in Ethiopia. Uh, but because of some colonialism, uh, these violations and resistance might have taken, you know, uh, different forms in the specific historical and uh, geographical uh, uh, Places, uh, for instance, uh, because of Ethiopia semi-colonial situation, uh, we can talk about uh, double colonialism uh, in 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 the context of Ethiopia, which is not, you know, uh, the case in other parts of the Horn of Africa. Uh, because of semi-colonialism, we can also talk about uh, a wider room. Uh, for agency on the part of you know the Ethiopian state, uh, be it in uh, in resisting European imperialism or be it in fostering its own you know uh, form of uh, local imperialism, uh, the same cannot be said uh, for instance uh, 
Kenya, I would argue. Uh, so uh, there are different, different uh, the, the, the form uh, is not uh, uh, unreal. I mean, the, the, the form of uh, the, the shape of the, the shape of uh, colonial engagement, colonial encounter between Europeans and Africans during the late 19th, the late 20th century, the late 19th century and 20th century uh, had its own, you know, consequence. And, uh, and I think we are still <coughs> grappling with the consequences of, you know, these forms of uh, imperialism. And uh, because of, uh, the implications of you know forms of imperialism, legal or otherwise, in Ethiopia, the the the, the, <coughs> the our engagement with international law as well as you know uh, different forces within Ethiopia uh, are taking different forms. Uh, uh, in different historical periods, and uh, what is what what we are witnessing right now uh, can, uh, in part, be explained by our semi-colonial history as well. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, we cannot um, uh, we cannot explain everything that is happening right now in terms of semi-colonialism, but again. Uh, part of you know uh, the reasons for our continued contest for for instance uh, uh, against Abyssinian imperialism in Ethiopia right now uh, is because of you know uh, the 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 form of European colonialism that uh, fostered it as well as you know uh, uh, undermined it uh, I would say Uh, I think I saw a hand from Johannes. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Leo. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Haile Gabriel. Uh, I hope I will meet you here in Melbourne as well. So I will raise my many of my questions uh, for you, Zain. Uh, for the time being, I have one question. Uh, what's your take regarding um, Leah's earlier reflection on the contribution of this uh, semi-colonialism scholarship um, for uh, Ethiopian approach to international law, or I would say third world approach to international law, because uh, following uh, the semi-colonial attempts by Italy or other um, European uh, colonialists, uh, there were um, you know some steps by former Ethiopian rulers or you know kings or. Um, uh, queens, for example, in IHN, um, like for the treatment of prisoners of war and also in treaty making, and also Ethiopia was the founding member of United Nations as well as a member of League of Nations. So, for that, what's your take? To what extent this semi colonialism scholarship contributes for the Ethiopian approach to international law? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, as um, Singh would have, uh, I mean, uh, Singh uh, and others uh, argued that uh, semi colonialism contributed to the universalization of international law in other parts of the semi colony. And uh, that is, you know, um, uh, a, a persuasive argument vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, Asian uh, semi-colonial policies, but, uh, uh, well, uh, I haven't, you know, directly uh, studied uh, how Ethiopia semi-colonialism contributed the, to the universalization of uh, international law in, in, in uh, parts of uh, the whole. Uh, or, um, I haven't, you know, uh, um, 
seriously thought about how you know this uh, is it this uh, semi-colonialism you know uh, influenced or impacted uh, uh, Ethiopians engagement with uh, contemporary uh, uh, movement is like the trail. Um, my uh, tentative uh, observation is that international law is not uh, uh, one of uh, the areas of laws uh, which with which Ethiopians back home, you know, uh, engage very seriously. It's not, you know, an area of law that is uh, uh, that we engage as passionately as we do with other uh, legal courts. Uh, so um, we're not, you know, as engaged as uh, others, uh, uh, the Indians or, you know, other, uh, the Japanese, uh, when it comes to international law, at least uh, uh, um, uh, Locally, I know there are uh, there are international legal scholars of Ethiopian origin, but their engagement uh, uh, is uh, is not uh, from uh, the perspective of Ethiopia, or uh, it's not you know situated in Ethiopia. Uh, so there is you know that. Uh, disinterest uh, when it comes to international engaging with international law. Um, but uh, throughout history, Ethiopia's engagement is there, however. Uh, this engagement uh, is an ambivalent one, it's a hybrid one. Uh, um, and it's it you know uh, reflects uh, this uh, autonomous as well as you know subordinate position of Ethiopia and this uh, uh, system of uh, estates that is you know dominated by European capitalist uh, estates. So uh, if we seriously you know uh, document Ethiopia's engagement with uh, uh, international law over the 20th century, I think uh, uh, we would find that uh, our engagement has been uh, as ambivalent as other semi colonial states in other parts of uh, the world. We have one question from uh, our follower on YouTube. Uh, his question is, were there other treaties that installed the extraterritorial regimes or was it only these two treaties that have been discussed earlier? There are plenty of them. Uh, uh, these are the, 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 the two or the three that uh, are discussed in this presentation or uh, throughout my work uh, are not the only ones. Definitely they are not the only ones. And uh, I think uh, some of the techniques or, you know, the, 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 the modes of, you know, uh, informal imperialism that was, you know, initiated through this instrument is, uh, can also be, you know, seen re being replicated uh, in contemporary uh, treaties uh, to which it obeys a party. Uh, I don't think, uh, we are uh, quite uh, uh, engaged with uh, or, you know, obsessed about our uh, continuous engagement with neoliberalism or, you know, the, the, this international order, uh, especially uh, uh, Ethiopian legal scholars back home. Uh, we're not the... Uh, 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 well, I'm not, you know, uh, necessarily out, outside of, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, does. Uh, I still, um, I, I'm still, you know, part of uh, those who sh who should, you know, share the blame uh, in not doing enough, you know, in uh, identifying and showing, you know, the continuous traces of, you know, semi-colonial practices or, you know, informal practice, informal imperialist modes uh, that are, you know, uh, placed uh, or uh, hidden in in uh, current uh, created that it is uh, uh, happily you know uh, uh, joining or uh, embracing and uh, legal scholars are celebrating. Is there any other question from the audience? If not, then I would really like to thank Dr. Haile Gavril from the bottom of my heart also because we are now pushing to midnight in Melbourne where he is. So he's been up until this time to talk to us about semi-colonialism semi in Ethiopia and to answer all of our questions. So we thank you on behalf of the Addis Ababa University Actual Clinic, as well as the Jindal Global Law School. We'd like to thank you very much. And we would also like to thank all our viewers for joining us today, for participating, for asking questions and providing your own comments on this. We will have another session, our last session for this webinar series on the 6th of May. So we would also love it if you could join us there and show the same type of motivation and engagement as today. So thank you all very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.